and the really high performing teams go quite deep quite often in the form of a simple vibe test so they say okay why did the model go wrong here let's look at the data that made it go wrong and then go from there data is treated as the dirty little secret of ai when it makes headlines it's usually for a bad reason i'm jennifer ding from oncord I'm a data scientist, data steward, and even a data festival organizer. I'm into data, and I think we should talk about it more. That is what AI Data Chats is for. In today's AI Data Chat, we are here with Ben Burtonshaw, ML Advocacy Engineer at Hugging Face. Welcome, Ben. What is our AI data topic for today, and what are you pairing it with? Okay, so our AI data topic for today is, is uh, data sets, synthetic data sets, and, and creating data sets for post-training LLMs for specific domains. And I'm pairing it with a green tea, a Sencha green tea from Japan. And uh, yeah, I actually drink this every day and, and it's great. My hot take is that the key to training high-performing models is vibe testing and the combination of vibe testing with synthetic data. And this might sound completely anti-scientific and completely problematic, but from my experience, what we've seen frequently is that low performing teams don't look as deeply into their data as regularly, and they don't look as deeply and as regularly into the predictions and generations of their models. They stick with dashboards and at a really high level, and they kind of try to rack their brains around it. And the really high performing teams go quite deep quite often in the form of a simple vibe test. So they say, okay, why did the model go wrong here? Let's look at the data that made it go wrong and then go from there and then look at metrics from there. Why is this model so good? Let's look at what it generates and, and why does it generate that? And what do the samples look like? And what do, what do its inputs look like when it's, it's generating these great samples? And so for me, the, the vibe test is the key to high performing models. Out of curiosity, how has your vibe testing, your approach to vibe testing changed over time? Yeah, so uh, I mean, a few years ago, everything was kind of ad hoc or, or personal. Um, and so you'd have Jupyter notebooks, you know, you'd have like an inference notebook where you could just quickly load the weights of, of a model. And um, and yeah, just, just infer and, and look at those predictions, or you'd maybe have something uh, where you could extract a, a certain sample from your data set in your notebook and, and look through that, maybe render it in some way. Mm -hmm. But now it, if you look at like Hugging Face Hub, a lot of this is integrated into the hub and its data set viewer. So you have like the data studio inside our data sets repos now. So you can just type SQL in and like query your data set and get a set of rows back and, and look at those rows. And there's even like a, a little uh, like AI coder in there that will write SQL queries if you've forgotten how to write SQL and stuff. So it, it's really easy now to do these kind of vibe tests. And the same thing with uh, with inference, that's all like integrated now. So it's, it's pretty good. So you were part of the Argilla team, a team building human feedback tools for AI data sets that was acquired by Hugging Face last year. I'm curious what is different about feedback data work compared to previous forms of AI data work? Um, yeah, so I suppose when you talk about feedback uh, for post-training methods and this sort of like feedback data sets, I guess the, the main difference is the task itself. So if you start from the task itself, like if you look at classification or regression tasks, they have um, verifiable contained responses to a given sample, a given input. If you look at post-training methods like supervised fine tuning or um, preference alignment like DPO, you would, you have really open-ended responses to these inputs, you know, so like um, teach me how to play the violin or, or give me a, a training, a learning schedule for learning the violin or something. And it's this long uh, response. And you're asking the human annotator to say if this is a good response, if is it valid, it requires a certain amount of expertise. It also requires a certain amount of taste and preferences, and these become complex and, and nuanced. So in general, there are many right answers to, to many samples. And then on top of that, another main difference is the inclusion of synthetic data and of LLMs as judges. So with that broad scope, we can then take an LLM and say, is this sample correct? Or is this a concise sample? And we can use these kind of metrics quite broadly before we put them in front of a human annotator. So then we can focus that, that manual annotator's work. And another area that I guess is one of the biggest changes is the, 
the process of mixing data sets from various different sources in order to train models. And like, let's say really model centric folk, like people that uh, really focus on their parameters rather than their data set. That's the sort of data work that they're kind of most into, I find. And this will be like taking a, let's just say a math data set, a code data set, and then a, a more general chat data set and turning the knobs to get a different mix of that data set. And then performing ablations to see performance metrics in relation to those different uh, mixes of, of data. And yeah, that, that has become re really central to the post-training process. So now that we are mixing data and also interacting with different tools like synthetic data generators or LLMs as judges to build and enrich our data sets, it sounds like we really need new tooling, new interfaces, and new kinds of interactions when it comes to data work. I've seen that in some of your projects, um, there's been a focus on tools that are no code or low code or trying to replace in some ways or reduce the need for days of human labeling. What direction do you think the human interaction side of data work is heading? Yeah, so I think that there are two sort of parallel problems or two parallel paradigms, let's say, that will emerge because at the end of the day, as models get uh get more performant they also start to the challenge moves to more specific domains so the the really challenging samples now for most llms are, are math problems coding problems really, really complex problems so often they're way outside the domain of the engineer and you need these this uh specific expertise from a from a manual reviewer at the same time the the ml engineer that built training the model can kind of vibe test and set up their synthetic data process at the very beginning and create a data set and see quite quickly that this data set uh, looks right from a high level. They can use different models, so let's say a high performing model and a, a, a low performing model to generate different versions of answers and they can create a, a valid data set like that. But they can't go deep and say, is this, is this sample correct? So it's this kind of back and forth process, which I think will probably not be code orientated because even the ML engineer kind of wants to look and configure this setup for their data set. So it might be more configuration orientated for them more declarative. And then for this domain expert, of course, you, you can't expect these domain experts to be able to, um, yeah, to code and, and to interact on that level. And in many domains, the actual representation of their tasks is really complex. Like if you look at math data sets, that just the representation of a math problem changes the nature of the problem. The same for coding. And if we look outside of purely uh, language tasks, it will get even more complicated as we start to think about interface and, and these kinds of things. Really interesting to think about the role of different humans. Um in the process and how to inject different forms of expertise into what we can capture. Last year, you led an initiative to build more domain-specific data sets. Any interesting findings from that project for the role or importance of domain-specific data for performance on various tasks? Yeah, so that was quite an interesting project in that it was quite enlightening for me because I, I really oriented around domain specific tasks like I, I had done that for a number of years and, and training up models for specific use cases and specific applications and I worked in a team of people at Gila that were all doing a similar kind of thing and I think that it was probably a bubble problem but we really thought that like everyone in the universe was training models for domain specific tasks like that, that's what every single ML engineer would, would do every day and from that project and like trying to make it completely approachable we we realized that actually it isn't like kind of a go-to strategy. Most of the field is kind of really orientated around um, using general data sets and then kind of testing them out for on their task and, and prompting models into performing their task and, and kind of just selecting bigger and bigger models and then improving their general abilities and then measuring them on these um, domain specific tasks. So it, we found that it wasn't as popular as we expected. But if you looked into specific areas like languages other than English and lesser spoken languages, specific domains like space, like uh, medicine, like agriculture, people in, in those domains were really enthusiastic. So 
the, the number of people that I spoke to was quite low, but the enthusiasm of the people that I spoke to was really, really high. And, and that was because in those domains, they know that, that it's a problem and the models that they're using aren't even close to solving their problems. Or, or at that point in time, they weren't even close to, to being able to respond to basic instruction. So yeah, it was a bit of a wake up call. And, and after that project, we, we went away and like kind of looked at other ways of, of encouraging people to build domain specific data sets, basically. So you mentioned prompting models as part of the workflow and the subject of agentic AI has been very popular lately. I'm curious what you think are opportunities for data specific agentic workflows? Yeah. So, I mean, there are some examples um, of this already, some papers that I'm, I'm sure you've seen where agents are, are used to review samples or used to rate samples. So like in a preference rating task, you can use an agent to say which sample of the two is better. What's quite powerful about this is that you can use, um, you can give the agent relevant tools to make the task verifiable. So you could give it like a Python interpreter or a, a code parser. Um, if it was a code problem, you could give it basic things like a, a calculator and you could allow it to, to validate uh, the structures that it was seeing. You could also give it a data set so that it could, uh, connection to a database so that it could look up and, and reference knowledge in the response against uh, its database. And all of those would work in the same way that LLM as a judge works, but you'd have a, an agent as a judge in this situation. I guess another example that I think, I think I'm probably most interested in would be around setting up more verifiable tasks. So if we look at GRPO, the algorithm that was used to train uh, DeepSeekR1, and it seems to be like one of the most popular, it seems to be the most effective reinforcement learning for post-training method around now. This depends on a, on a verifiable task, like a, like a math task we, we know has an answer. Coding task has a solution that will solve the problem. If we take this outside of those domains, it gets harder to implement a verifiable task. So GRPO depends on these functions that you can define as your reward function. And if you use something like a agent instruct you, or an agent within to create your data set, you can use that agent to verify against different sources to create this kind of verifiable task. So you have also been an instructor for several online courses, including the recent very popular AI agents course on Hugging Face. Any patterns of data related challenges your students have raised or encountered across the different courses like the agents course? Yeah, this is a, an interesting question. I mean, as a as a teacher, you you encounter a certain, you encounter a common you you encounter common problems as students figure out uh, new topics and the parts of the problem that they're allowed to play with or that should play with. And I remember from my own experience when I first learned about a data centric approach to ML, I thought that it was cheating. Uh, and I, I see that a lot in students now. I remember being in a shared task as an academic and I basically significantly increased the performance of my model because I uh, improved the quality of the data set. And I went to my supervisor and I was like, I, I, think, I, I think I'm cheating. And, uh, and he was like, you're not actually, <laughs> this, this is okay. And I see the same kind of thing um, with, with students. Like they're, they become so focused on model centric approach to, to post training and trying to get their head around every single parameter and the kind of effects it would have that at some points they have absolutely no idea what's in the data set beyond this like reference id uh, you know and, and it's just because they're so fixated on the complexity of modeling and trying to get their brain around that and trying to learn that which is understandable and sometimes what i make an effort to do is to say okay let's just have a look in this data set Let's see how it's structured to begin with. What does that tell us about the algorithm? Okay, now let's look at the content. What does that tell us? And and kind of break it down. And I think GRPO as an algorithm, which I recently created a new course called the reasoning course around this GRPO algorithm. That's a really nice post-training algorithm to teach because of these reward functions. So they're very simplistic functions where you can say, okay, let's reward the model when it generates shorter responses. Let's reward the model when the data has like a XML structure, for example. And because this is so simple and it's like regex and just counting things, it forces the student to look at it from a data point of view and from quite a practical point of view. 
So for that course, we set up these like interactive notebooks that you could adjust and change the reward function like within the written material. So that leads us to the final part of this chat, which is our rapid fire round. So we will run through five questions that we ask every speaker whenever you're ready. Question one, what scale of data are you working with these days? So I guess 10 to 20,000 samples, which typically equates to roughly 20 million tokens, depending on the length. And that's not the most ideal length for post-training, but that's in an educational environment, a really good length to start up. Any favorite data sets you've come across recently? It's not necessarily that new. Um, I guess it would be fine personas. It's a data set of personas. So a persona is a a description of a person like a, an ml engineer or an estate agent and it, has, it gives a detailed definition of that and you can combine fine personas with other prompting strategies to create data sets uh, with variety so let's say you're prompting the model and you're constantly getting ml engineer style responses you can pick a range of other similar personas use those in your prompt and create more uh, higher variety data sets by attaching to those different personas what do you think is an AI data challenge that should be receiving more attention? Um, yeah, so one I would look at is a so process reward modeling, which, which relates to what I mentioned earlier around GRPO and these verifiable tasks, but more verifiable tasks and then uh, more detailed process rewards within those data sets to say the LLM completed this uh, task correctly and then within its task these steps were also correct or, or how successful were these and we can do this for math but we can't do this for tasks outside of math what do you think 2025 is the year of for ai data i mean everyone is saying agents right so and i i kind of um i i probably agree with them but i i think i'd like it to also be well i'm optimistic about it also being the year for sort of AI education and, and a real like broadening of the groups and types of people that are are involved in, in AI and and the level to which they're involved. So we kind of take up the the mass of people from prompting and kind of move them up to building models and, and building data sets and, and really contributing in a real way. Like that's why I'm optimistic about it. And final question to close out today's chat. How was your pairing of your drink with today's data topic um probably probably okay <laughs> but it wasn't a, it wasn't a 10 fair enough fair enough well thanks for joining us ben where can we find more of your work so uh, on the hub uh, i most of my work is on the is on the learn platform hf.co forward slash learn but i'm also on there um as Burton Shaw, my surname, and I share regularly like all of the courses I build and, and all the material I build via that. Well, that wraps up this AI data chat. You can find links to our speaker's work in the episode description. If you'd like to share your thoughts or suggest a speaker, email us at aidatachats.encore.com.